Good evening. Welcome to the BIC. The Bangalore International Center, as many of you know, offers a platform for arts, culture, and informed conversations. Our events are entirely free for the public. Please do sign up to be on our mailing list and you can follow us on social media. Today, we're delighted to have with us Gautam Bhatia. I heard Gautam a few years ago at the NCBS riveting lecture on the Constitution. So we are, we are really delighted that he could be here today to share some of his other thoughts on the Constitution. Gautam is a Delhi-based lawyer, legal scholar. He is the author of Offend, Shock, or Disturb, Freedom of Speech under the Indian Constitution, and also the Transformative Constitution, which came out in 2019. Today, Gautam will talk for about 40, 45 minutes on a lecture on conversations with power, looking at the Indian Constitution. The talk will consider the Indian Constitution as a terrain of contestation between different visions of power. Gautam's talk will be followed by a Q&A, so please hold on to your questions, which will be taken at that mic over there. You can just walk down with your questions after he finishes his lecture. Um, please, usual statutory announcement, do put your phones on silent or on airport mode. And over to you, Gautam. Looking forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's always nice to be back in Bangalore, a city I spent uh, many happy years. Um, the ideas that form the base um, of this talk had their life or had their origin in certain events that took place on 5th of August 2019, which you all remember the, um, the various sort of constitutional and parliamentary moves that led to the effective abrogation of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution and the degradation of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir into a centrally controlled union territory. Um, around 24 hours after these events, when most of us were still just trying to figure out what exactly had happened, um, I was approached by a couple of petitioners to file a case uh, challenging this, these set of moves uh, in the court. And me and a couple of colleagues then, uh, then drafted a constitutional challenge. And when I first saw you know, the, the presidential orders that were, you know, responsible for these sweeping changes. It seemed to me that this was so egregious um, that it simply couldn't fly. Um, and well, yes, you know, it may still fly in court, um, you know, because cases like this often have political significances that go beyond strictly legal arguments. But it seemed to me that just looking at it as a constitutional lawyer, uh, this was so outrageous and what we call constitutional skullduggery that uh, it, it, it would have to be, uh, at least in principle, it was unconstitutional. But then the more that I read and the more me and my colleagues read, um, you know, the text of the constitution, Article 370, its history and the judgments around it, uh, the more it turned out that the state did have a decent case, much to my surprise, um, and then there seemed to be a bit of a dissonance between what, as an, as an eyeball test, just seemed so wrong, but what nonetheless appeared to, you know, have some grounding um, or some sanction uh, in, in the constitution. Of course, I, I still believe it's unconstitutional, but it wasn't as clear cut as I originally thought. Um, and so that led me to question a settled belief that, that I and others had had for a long time, which was that the Indian constitution is a wonderful document. Uh, it's transformative. It's something I've spoken of before. The problem has been over the years, uh, judges have stifled its transformative character. And, um, and so if we could just get the right judgments, you know, the Indian constitution would fulfill its transformative goal. That uh, belief was thrown into some serious doubt and question um, when I and my colleagues studied the actual text of Article 370, its history, and, you know, the seven decades of its operation. Uh, and that led us to believe that it, maybe we need to look at the Constitution itself a little more critically, a little more closely. And, and hence, um, and this talk, which shifts away a bit from uh, my, my, my previous discussions about the Indian Constitution's transformative character. So, constitutions, by their very nature, have a story to tell. And... 
when you look at the stories around the Indian Constitution, there are three that that stand out. One is the notion that the Indian Constitution reflects simply a transfer of power between the erstwhile British government, colonial government, and the independent Indian government. Um, much of the administrative apparatus was was retained. Many of the restrictive provisions like preventive detention were, were retained. And a large part of the text of the Indian constitution is a replica of uh, the 1935 Government of India Act. So in that way, the Indian constitution is thought to be a document of continuity. Uh, the second story is the transformative story, which is that actually the Indian constitution was meant to mark a break from the colonial era, both in the political sense, in the sense that we moved from a colonial government to an independent republic. So in a political sense now, there was democracy, accountability, and so on. Also in a social sense, that the constitution meant to interrogate social power structures around caste, uh, gender, economic disparity, and so on. Uh, and there you have a number of, of, of stories that branch out from this main story. So one common story is that um, for the first 25, 30 years, the Indian Supreme Court was a conservative court that um, interpreted the constitution in a conservative way. And that changed in the 1980s after you know, the ADM Jabalpur habeas corpus judgment in the emergency, the court repented. And uh, from the 1980s with the development of public interest litigation and the expansion of the fundamental rights chapter, uh, the court began to move towards the constitution's transformative vision. Somewhat more critical story is that actually that's a bit of an overstatement. And while we do have transformative judgments, uh, over the years, the court's orientation still remains broadly conservative. The third story is that the constitution essentially is a document of compromise. So um, the constitution assembly was polyphonous, polyvocal. There were many competing interests. And, uh, and finally, what is reflected in the document is a compromise that made everyone a little unhappy, but not too unhappy. And that is how we have been getting along um, since then. And if you look at the chapter on the directive principles of state policy, which has everything from labor rights to cow slaughter um, to you know science, you, you see some of that compromise reflected there. So these are three broad stories about the Indian constitution, what it means and what and how it's embedded in our broader idea of nationhood. What's common to these three stories is that they all focus on one specific part of the Indian constitution, which is the fundamental rights chapter. So they focus on part three, which begins with the definition of the state, goes on to talk about equality, uh, reservations, untouchability, free speech, life, personal liberty, forced labor, religion, minority rights, and so on. And the character of the Indian constitution is um, is believed to flow from those rights and the principles that they embody, like secularism, um, certain kind of equal treatment, and so on. Now, that is, according to me, a somewhat limited view of the Constitution. Because if you just look at the constitutional text, uh, the fundamental rights chapter actually occupies about 10% of uh, the total text of the Indian Constitution. There's 90% of it that has nothing to do um, with rights. And so the question is, what is in that 90% and, and why don't we really think about that when we think about the story the constitution is telling? And in this context, the work of a Latin American scholar, Roberto Gargarella, is very interesting because what he says is that, and this is in the context of studying two centuries of Latin American constitutionalism, that every constitution has two parts, an organic part and a dogmatic part. The dogmatic part is statements of rights, bills of rights, declarations of rights. This is, these are the rights that individuals have against the state, against each other, and so on. The other part is the organic part, which deals with how the constitution organizes power. So who has power? Who doesn't have power? How is power exercised? Upon whom is it wielded? How is it wielded? And so on. And the point that Gargarella makes is that the two are connected. So... And analyzing the long history of Latin American constitutionalism, he points out that starting with the Mexican constitution of 1917, which was the outcome of a sustained 
um, revolutionary movement, you had a process by which Latin American constitutions began to set out wider and wider, more and more inclusive bills of rights, uh, far before, long before it became popular in the West, social economic rights are part of Latin American constitutions, many other rights. And with each successive constitutional slash revolutionary slash political movement, the bills of rights would get bigger. But at the same time, those constitutions did not touch the organization of power, which remained predominantly vested in the figure of the president. Those of you who have read Latin American novels, you know, this is a very common theme. You know, the, the, the Cordillo or the, the president who has a lot of power, executive authority, and how that leads to a certain kind of authoritarianism. And so that has remained constant for two centuries, even as bills of rights have grown. And then Gagarella points out that there is a link. And, and as long as you leave this organic part, what he calls the engine room of the constitution untouched, you can have all the bills of rights that you want. Uh, but until you democratize power itself, uh, it's going to be very hard to genuinely have transformation because the, the power to actually choose to implement or not uh, those bills of rights still remains in an authoritarian sort of unaccountable center. Um, and that's the point that he makes. And and that's interesting because that does translate well. You know, and it, it leads us to ask um, in the Indian constitution, because from the 1980s onwards, we've had a similar sort of expansion of our fundamental rights chapter at the instance of the courts. So, you know, more and more rights. Uh, Article 21 is the repository of these rights. Uh, sort of progressive if you look at it on paper. But when it comes to the crunch, not much of it actually works in any meaningful way. And then, of course, then the question then is that is that because of the way that the Indian constitution organizes power? And that's the inquiry then we should um, we should turn to. So when we think about the relationship between the Indian constitution and power, the first thing to note is that commonly constitutional theory that has been drawn from the United States and the you know the U.S. Constitution that sort of inaugurated the era of modern constitutionalism, it, it thinks about constitutions as essentially constraining state power. So the point of a constitution is to establish rule of law, which in turn means that you place limits and checks upon the way that the state can exercise power, uh, you know, upon individuals and so on. There's a longer story there, which you know we can get into in the Q and A, but that's the idea. And the first thing to note is that that is not the story of the Indian constitution and its framing. Because when the Indian constitution was being framed, the economic, social and cultural circumstances that the framers confronted uh, were very different. Starting with widespread poverty and illiteracy, um, the prospect of integrating more than 500 princely states into the union, uh, the prospect of secessionist movements and so on, um, all of that presented a very different challenge before the framers of the Indian constitution. And therefore, and this is a point that has been made by the likes of Uday Mehta, Pratap Banu Mehta and so on, is that the Indian constitution was not about constraining power as much as it was about enabling power. So the idea was that you need to have uh, state power, you need to have you know, political power in order to solve this, the problems that India faces at the scale at which it is facing. Uh, so the constitution is meant to be, you know, enabling the deployment of that power so that we can you know, deal with poverty, um, deal with the social problems, deal with structures like caste and so on. Uh, you know, and Ambedkar says this many times, that you have to have a strong authority so that these sort of extra constitutional bodies can no longer exercise the sway that they do. Um, so... Therefore, that, that was a very different sense of, of what, what the framers were doing. Uh, and so then, of course, that leads us to the next question, which is that what does the Indian constitution say about power, its enablement and its use and its exercise? And here, I would say two things. I think one is that if you look at the constitution, like any written document that uses language, when language being inherently subjective, open to interpretation, having silences, having gaps, it is a terrain of contestation. 
that is ine- inevitable wherever you use a written text as the basis for organizing social and political life so it is a terrain of contestation where different visions and ideas of power are articulated in different provisions in texts and in silences and often they are at odds with each other and there is then a constant struggle about which vision of power is meant to prevail or predominate and if you look at the constitution i would say that there are six such axes that emerge along which power is contested the um, first one is just intuitive one it's federalism and centralism so the um, indian constitution is a federal constitution it article 1 says india that is bharat shall be a union of states so it is composed of the states after the 73rd and 74th amendments it is there are now three tiers of of governance so the center the states uh, and local government each of which exercise a range and a set of powers and in fact the uh, illustration that i'll draw upon a little while later will actually be um, in the context of the federal compact so that's the first axis along which power is distributed between the center the central government central executive the, the parliament on the one hand and uh, state legislatures state executives on the other and to an extent the third um, the third tier of governance uh, as well the second axis is the parliament and the executive so if the center and the federal uh, the states are sort of a vertical hierarchy of power sent at the center and then the states the legislature and the executive are a horizontal uh, there's a horizontal distribution of power india has a parliamentary form of government so the idea is that you know the executive and this is again of course theoretical in the real situation is much messier than this but that the executive implements laws parliament passes laws and executive is responsible to parliament so executive stays in power as long as it has the confidence of of parliament and it's the two tasks are clearly delineated um in all parliamentary systems whether it is the uk from which it originated in its modern form or elsewhere there is of course a constant struggle for supremacy between the executive and parliament you know uh, executive keeps trying to dominate parliament parliament keeps trying to assert authority and a lot of this has to do with is there a coalition government is there a majority government and so on so that is the second axis along which power is distributed uh, one interesting thing about the indian constitution and i'll come back to this is that over the years if you look at the evolution of the constitutional text and i don't mean interpretation of the text you see an extensive strengthening of the executive at the cost of parliament so for example the anti defection law which is the 10th schedule effectively says that if a parliamentarian um votes against the party whip and again i'm simplifying then they will be disqualified uh if they vote against the party whip what that basically means is that one very important source of pressure that parliament exercises over the executive in democracies in general which is that it can defeat the agenda of the executive in india goes away because that because voting against the whip then means that you lose your seat and people don't want to do that obviously so that is one example of how the indian constitution through evolution and through amendments has decreased the power of parliament and has increased the power of the executive another example for instance is the speaker so in the uk the convention is that the speaker has to be independent and therefore um when the speaker is elected then they are meant to resign their party membership they no longer members of their parties and they are meant to represent the interests of parliament as a body against the executive whereas in india we know that that's not how it works um speakers are invariably appointees of the ruling party and so therefore effectively the the officer or the official who is the head of parliament is actually an executive appointee right so again you have an issue so there are many such um examples that show how even as in theory india is a parliamentary democracy if you go into the weeds you find that there are all these little little things that effectively disempower parliament and empower the executive and when you you know these days often people say parliament is dead you know it's not nothing happens there 
a large part of the reason why is that it's dead because the way the constitution structures par makes it easy for a strong executive to just marginalize um, parliament and that is attributable to how the constitution envisages that relationship the third axis is between homogeneity and pluralism so it has long been recognized that diverse societies societies with the range of cultures nations ethnicities languages and so on are often best held together through the mechanism of constitutional pluralism which means that you don't have a one size fits all when it comes to like legal frameworks governance and so on but you have you know different arrangements that reflect the diversity of the nation in the indian constitution one one very prominent example was article 370 Uh, because through that given the unique historical situation in which the uh, jammu and kashmir exceeded to the indian union there was a certain kind of specific autonomy it was granted uh, it was the only state with its own constitution uh, and that is an example of what is technic- technically called asymmetric federalism that um, different states have different relationships with the union uh, that reflects certain kind of of uh, of pluralism the other very prominent example is what we call the fifth and sixth scheduled areas um, which are areas where indigenous peoples live and um, and the constitution accords them a kind of self governance sort of structure of governance that differs uh, from the rest of the country a certain kind of autonomy is granted and so on um, even in article 371 which is what comes after 370 you have 10 or 11 different sub clauses where different states from andhra pradesh to nagaland to mizoram to sikkim have different arrangements in various domains including for example the passing of laws reservations and so on that again reflect the specific situations in those states so that is an example of you know power as distributed between a homogenous view of how affairs will be run and a pluralistic view uh, that allows to different components of the union a certain kind of autonomy in how they will run their own affairs the fourth axis is between electoral institutions and guarantor institutions now it's the classic theory of constitutionalism is that you have these three wings of state executive legislature and judiciary and power is divided among these three that was never entirely true and it is not true specifically for mod- the complexity of modern states so one set of institutions that have arisen in modern states are what go by a range of names integrity institutions guarantor institutions fourth branch institutions and so on but they are broadly a set of institutions that are meant to exercise a certain kind of oversight over the executive that courts can't do because courts aren't equipped to exercise that kind of oversight so what do i mean by that for example classically an election commission an election commission is an unelected body that is meant to exercise oversight over the process and conduct of elections and therefore has the power to enforce election that elections happen in a free and and fair way other instances include human rights commissions that are meant to again have a degree of independence from the executive so that they can exercise oversight over executive impunity and and all of that information commissions so rti is an example of a body that is un- unelected that is meant to ensure that you can exercise transparency in governance so you have all these bodies that are not elected that don't draw their power from elections but whom bodies you need to ensure that in very specific ways um, governance and democracy and transparency and accountability go beyond simply periodic elections and even in between elections there are ways to to hold the executive accountable and to exercise uh, certain kinds of rights that uh, don't need you to wait till the next election and you can throw out those guys and bring in the next to other sort of guys so that's the fourth axis of power between elected bodies parliament executive and non elected fourth branch guarantor integrity institutions the fifth axis and this is a really important one is between the state and and the people now the indian constitution like every other constitution begins with the 
phrase we the people so the ringing phrase we the people do enact adopt and give to ourselves this constitution and then when you go further down you find that after the preamble the constitution just seems to forget about the people they don't they, they go off the stage and they're not seen anymore um and the only involvement that the constitution seems to envisage of the people is again through elections uh, but in between elections there seems to be no involvement of of the people in the conduct of law making administration and so on this is not something inevitable so for example when the debates were happening in the constituent assembly one proposal that was advanced was that of recall the right to recall so you know electors citizens can recall the representatives if they think they're not doing a good job based on certain threshold requirements that was voted down in various other constitutions you have explicit guarantees of public participation so the government is obligated under the constitution to ensure that there is public participation in and before and after the making of laws specifically in contexts like say environmental laws when a law will say of effect or you know impact and the environment and the 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 homelands of indigenous peoples certain constitutions especially in latin america provide a specific enshrined right to participation in that decision uh, so there are various ways in which we the people can actually mean we the people there are ways in which to bring back the people into the constitutional firmament um, as opposed to simply saying that look the people are actors only in elections and beyond that the only relevant constitutional actors are representatives so you know and if the people want to have an impact they can protest but there are no constitutional channels uh, through which that they can get involved so that's the difference between say representative democracy and direct democracy so that is a fifth axis of uh, of power and the sixth axis is again simply state and individual so and here's where the bill of rights comes in so the point of a fundamental rights chapter is to ensure that the vast power at the disposal of the state is mitigated and constrained uh, and in some way the imbalance of power between the individual and the state is redressed through the protection of rights something like for example the right against self incrimination ensures that the power the police exercises over you in the police station in the context in which you are completely vulnerable has certain limits and a rebalancing happens where there are things they can't do to you uh, when they have you in their power so that is the point of a bill of rights so these are you know i think one way of looking at the constitution is to look at it in terms of power maps and these are six axes along which the constitution organizes power Uh, and as we can see there are different conflicting visions so a centralized vision versus a more federal vision a homogenous vision versus a more plural vision a vision that focuses on horizontal distribution between houses of parliament within parliament and a vision that concentrates power in the executive a vision that limits democracy and the constitution to just representatives and elections and a vision that sees a much more expansive role for citizens and the people a vision that says that there is no need for accountability or oversight of the three wings of state versus a vision that says that yes you do need other bodies to check and generate accountability and of course a vision that talks about the relative balance of power between state and individual so these are the terrains of contestation in the constitution there are contestation happens along the text and in as i said in silences and interpretation ambiguities and so on and the basic case that i want to make is that if you look at the constitutional text if you look at the constitution structure and if you look at the judicial interpretation of the constitution over the last seven decades these three things what you find is a centralizing drift that is that over the years there has been a gradual move along these six axes of contestation towards a central and centralized idea of power at the cost of more plural decentralized visions you see manifestations of it you know 
over the last few years because what you have is you know after many years of coalition government you have a majority government in power that is determined to push the limits of its power under the constitutional framework so you see manifestations of it a lot in the last few years but it would be a mistake to think of it as a problem of the present government it is a problem that is in my view much deeper and is baked into the text and the structure and the interpretation of the constitution over the years so in the last 10 minutes or so i will take an example to illustrate uh, the point that i'm making and um, and this example is but an intuitive one it's the federal example uh, the federalism under the indian constitution so as i said the article 1 india that is bharat it's union of states so you know you have the union you have the states as the two important component units of the indian federation if you look at the constitutional text uh, you will find that this is uh, is a skewed federation because there is a lot more power that the union has at the cost of the states this is not controversial i mean this is this is something everyone obviously knows about so for example article 3 uh, parliament can create new states destroy states modify their boundaries and so on unilaterally um the distribution of power to legislate and the fields under which legislation happens is set out under schedule 7 of the indian constitution so list 1 is fields where parliament legislates list 2 is fields where states legislate and list 3 uh, is fields where they can both legislate Some, something like you know uh, land for example is a state subject for instance um, and what is crucial is a residuary power right so any power or any field that is not contained within these three lists by default the union the parliament legislates right so the default is that if you can't find something covered then parliament has the power if there is a clash between in the concurrent list between parliament and state law parliamentary law prevails it's another example the the constitution's fiscal provisions you know uh, effectively for example parliament can if if any state owes a debt to the parliament uh, to the center the center can control its borrowing and every state owes debt to center so you have all these provisions that that you know skew uh, the balance and that is not really of interest because that's something obvious you can all see that that is an interesting bit the interesting bit is what follows from that right so you have this skewed structure and within that you have ambiguity silences and so on so when a dispute arises between the states and the center how should we understand this skewed constitution and how should we resolve that dispute and here you have a case that um i call an inflection point that is that a case where there were two stories still waiting to be told there were two paths open to the court uh, because the case came before the court to resolve as as cases do and the court supreme court picked the centralizing route and that's something you see across the axes so this case is a case called state of west bengal versus union of india back in 1962 i think was the year so quite a, a way back when a lot was still open a lot was still left to be decided the um, what happened was that parliament passed an act called the coal bearing areas act and they sought to acquire uh, properties in various states properties of various states in order to engage in the production of coal and one of the states was was west bengal so west bengal challenged um, the notifications under which the center sought to acquire state property to carry on its its coal operations the dispute turned upon entry 42 of list 3 so list 3 is the concurrent list where both um, parliament and state assemblies have the power to legis- have the field to legislate and uh, list entry 42 says acquisition and requisitioning of property so that was the source uh, so parliament claimed authority to, to legislate from that entry state of west bengal argued that when this provision says acquisition and requisitioning of property you have to read it as carrying an implied exclusion that is acquisition and requisitioning of property except state property and the reason for that the state of west bengal argued is federalism so if federalism means anything it means that the different levels of government center and states 
are sovereign in their own departments and their own spheres and so one of the important incidences of sovereignty is the ability to control your own property and so therefore if there is state property um parliament or the senate should not be able to acquire it and therefore you should read this implied limitation into the text of entry 42 so the majority of the supreme court rejected this argument they upheld the notifications and there was a dissenting opinion i'll come to that in a moment uh, and what's interesting is that the majority told two stories one was a historical story a, his- a certain history or a certain political history of india and the second was the legal story of the consequences that flowed from that history so what was the history the history according to the majority judgment was that when representative government began in colonial india with 1909 reforms and so on there was no concept of autonomy or federalism it was basically always a centralized unitary state over time there was some devolution of power to provinces and but at no point did the provinces of the states have an independent existence so unlike in the us example which the supreme court took as sort of the model federal example where you had independent sovereign states that came together gave up their part part of their past to form a union in the indian case you just had a unitary sort of entity with some devolution and then at the moment of the constitution's framing all power was given to the people and then given back in this federal form between states and the union and so you, and so using this history the supreme court then argued the majority argued that therefore there was no question of there being anything like federal sovereignty in their respective spheres and then looking at the existing skew that was there in the constitutional text all the things i mentioned before the majority therefore said that this means that the indian constitution is quasi federal with a central bias and therefore it follows that this notification is valid because the constitution is meant to favor a uh, central power over state power and therefore there is no problem with the acquisition of state property uh, so that was the the um, reading that the majority gave and what i want to point out is that while the majority judgment feels like it is an inevit- inevitability an inevitable historical story leading to an inevitable legal consequence if you interrogate it a bit more closely you find that neither of those two are sequiturs at all so for instance the historical story is very contestable um as hm sirvai the great constitutional scholar pointed out in his critique of this judgment it completely misread the history because actually self government in in colonial india did begin with provincial autonomy and there was strong provincial autonomy for 20 30 years and there was a clear what sirvai calls a federal situation that existed in india during the colonial times and so while yes it's true that the states were not independent as they were in the us that is not a relevant difference they existed there was there were provincial movements and so there is no warrant to assume that that there was only a unitary state in india and there were no there was no such concept of federalism before the constitution so the historical story is is contestable and then the next contest is on what follows so one reading is that okay look at the constitution it has all these asymmetrical skewed provisions that favor the center over the states and therefore it follows that any dispute or ambiguity should be resolved in favor of the center because that's where the constitution leans but that depends upon a certain default understanding of what the constitution is doing because the other equally plausible argument is that actually it is always meant to be a federal constitution and therefore wherever the constitution intended to depart from the federal arrangement it did so in explicit terms so wherever there is a skew in the constitutional text it is made explicit say article 3 where the parliament has the power to change state boundaries or 
schedule 7 where residuary power is with the parliament so wherever you want to depart from federalism you explicitly make it clear and it then follows that therefore where you haven't made it clear where there is an ambiguity or a silence the answer is that you have to res resolve it in favor of the states because the default is a federal compact a federal arrangement and so you can see that there are two equally plausible stories uh, one that reads history in a certain way and which then derives a certain legal consequence from that history. And the other is a different reading of history and then an equally different reading of the legal consequence flowing from that history. And the consequences themselves are massive when it comes to who has power under the constitution because in one case, you are basically saying that wherever the constitution is silent and there are many such places, the center will have the power and, and that gives a huge amount of extra power to the center. On the other hand, you are saying that wherever there is silence or ambiguity, the states will have the power and that gives an equally massive swing to the states. And the Supreme Court in this case, say of West Bengal, answered the question one way. It was till that point unanswered. So it answered the question one way and once it had, then after that, the one path was opened and another was closed because now you have a binding binding judgment that interprets the constitution in a particular way and so that therefore takes us down one path and closes off the other the dissenting judgment made all the points that i've just made you know and said that look ultimately what is the point the point is that any diverse plural country needs a federal compact to to hold together and if that is the normative baseline from which we start um, then it follows that any ambiguity or silence should be resolved in favor of the federalism principle and not in favor of the centralizing principle. So though this case is interesting, not just because it was an important case that laid, that laid down the marker for how the Supreme Court would go on to look at this federal axis of power, but also because in these two judgments, majority and dissent, you see very starkly these two alternative readings of the constitution that really show you how the text is a terrain of contestation because in their own way both are plausible and it ultimately depends upon what you think the constitution is for and that will determine how you read a wide range of provisions and how you answer these really crucial conflicts that have such a great bearing uh, on which way power will go uh, under the constitution. After this case, this has become almost constitutional common sense that, oh, we are, so if you read any text or any account or judgments, you always find that, oh, we are a quasi federation, it's skewed towards the center. And so therefore, you know, it's not really a feder federation. And, you know, it's, it's, if there's a dispute, if there's a silence, then obviously center has power. And it sounds inevitable because now that's been the story for the last 60 years. But what this case shows you that it wasn't inevitable and there were other stories and it was a choice that was made that this is the story we are going with um, at the cost of this other story. And of course, it then follows that even now it's not inevitable because any story can be changed, you know, reversed and so on. Um, in many cases, this sort of constitutional common sense played an important role in cases where you wouldn't often think of it. So cases challenging national security laws, AFSPA, uh, TADA, all had federalism arguments being made that look, there is a silence in the constitution and this is not a power the center has. And each time the court said, but because it's ambiguous, therefore the center has the power. In cases involving distribution of finances, cases involving the MP LAD scheme, uh, which you, know, you all know of, you know, cases involving the reorganization of states and so on, each time you have this contestation happening and each time you have like a, a more and more of an encrustation of this idea that because the constitution skews towards the center, therefore we must read it as entrenching that skew even further when there is a doubt. And you know, the point is that that is not what needs to happen. So just to conclude then, um, I think that Understanding the constitution through the lens of, of power really reveals certain important insights that perhaps you know are, are missed if we focus exclusively on rights. 
in fact the question of rights itself is a is embedded in how the constitution organizes and distributes power um and um, if we look at the constitution closely we see that there is you know a terrain of contestation along many axes uh you know and you or one vision is a centralized vision and one vision is a much more plural and and diverse vision and you know over the years there's been a drift towards the former um but and I'll end on this no drift is ever irreversible and so if we do think that that the more plural the more diverse the more decentralized vision is a more attractive one then that's something that's worth um, you know struggling for inside the court room outside wherever you know in in discourse and debate and so on so um, so with that i will close and uh, you know can have a q and a after that. thank you thank you gautam we'll uh, open the floor now for questions please make your way to the mic over there so uh, i want to start off with the obvious question have you seen instances where it's gone the other way towards federalism as a court judgment or as a parliamentary decision yeah that's a that's a good question and yes it has happened um, so you have various parliamentary amendment uh, constitutional amendments so for example the creation of the third tier of government it was a big decentralizing move all the amendments that brought in asymmetric federalism in nagaland sikkim and so on are examples of of that move interpretation wise the recent judgment in uh, nct of delhi versus union you know, of india the dispute between the delhi government and the union over the distribution of powers with the lg and the elected delhi assembly you see in the original judgment uh, uh, again a counter move of a certain kind uh, which has been substantially watered down after that but you do see it the most famous example perhaps is the sr bomai judgment arising out of uh, karnataka in fact where the court put limits on the power of uh, the executive and parliament to dismiss uh state governments and after that there has been much less use of of that provision or dismissal of state governments and there are many interesting observations in the bomai case about federalism that sort of make have a bit of a counter move um you know against against um uh, against uh, this dominating centralizing view and of course the most powerful driver has been politics you know so every time you have a coalition government at the center there is obviously and always essentially you know that counter move happens towards the greater decentralization of power and over the years all the strong state movements have contributed towards that so i think the push and pull has been a lot more in the domain of politics but the reason why it's still important to focus on the constitution is because the constitution sets the boundaries of what is possible in politics so some things you can't do because the constitution you know prohibits it and some things you can do because the constitution facilitates it or makes it easier so uh, so yeah so yeah so it, it, the brief answer is that yes uh, in all the domains there's always been a pushback but overall it's been a lot more uh, towards centralization than the opposite uh, but the pushback shows you that it's always possible to have that uh, at any any time i'm ramesh shastri uh, my question is with the <clears throat> population of the country with the northern states becoming more and more populous as against the southern states or the uh, less pros- prosperous states becoming more and more uh, populated than the uh, southern states and the parliament i think in 226 yeah. 2026 will have uh, representation in parliament by the population mm-hmm. will the federal structure that is the diversity of the people mm. of one set of states being different mm. will the implementation of the constitution as it is today will get affected yeah that's a that's a great question and that you you see the murmurs of that already you know because um the whole um the whole argument the argument is that southern states have been better uh, you know at family planning and so on and if now you decrease their political power through a census that updates the from 1971 and now uses present populations then it will mean that the representation of southern states in parliament will massively decrease as a proportion uh you know and so and and the the representation political power of northern states will increase and that's of course can be a potential cause for problems now 
so i think it's definitely a problem and the common solution that's mooted in is that you need to depart from the one person one vote principle and sort of limit the political power of the northern states uh, in a way that the value of say one vote counts for less in the northern states than in southern states and you know there are various ways you can do that uh, you know because the historically the constitution and the courts have allowed from a strict departure a uh, strict departure from the one person one vote principle to accommodate these kinds of concerns i think that that's a flawed response because it effectively you know blames or decreases the political power of individuals for for structural issues uh, that they have no control over and i think a better answer actually is in in federalism because the reason why this is a big issue is because of the overwhelming power of the central you know government and and, and parliament that has been entrenched over the years at the cost of the federal scheme and so representation in parliament is the prize that then you have to fight for because that's where the power lies as opposed to in the state assemblies if you were to change that and if you were to make the center less powerful uh, and make the states more powerful then the stakes would would lower because then it's not such a big prize to fight over so so actually i think that that the precise problem you mention um, the answer is in more federalism and more decentralization but i think that that's sort of utopian because right now the overwhelming push is towards more centralization and more power at the center so i don't see i i, I again you know politics is unpredictable so i don't see what will happen but um, it seems hard that that will be a solution that will actually come to pass uh, and it seems more likely that there'll be conflict over you know limiting uh the power of the northern states so just postponing the census once more freezing it 1971 so i think that is a more likely outcome uh than uh, than more federalism hi uh, i'm man from nls and uh, it's great to have you here uh, um so my question was that you mentioned state of west bengal where yeah. uh, uh, the court chose a certain story when there were silences in the constitution and i mean that's what happens in all cases right yeah. like you also mentioned state of ncd and there the court argued that just because there's a centralizing drift doesn't mean that you have to interpret every provision with a centralizing drift and in that particular case they did interpret uh, it in favor of the provincial unit that is the ncd of delhi um and like in the hijab case you saw once judge favoring the yeah. homogeneity story and the other yeah. the uh, plural plural story so they were struggling to understand what your argument is there like is your argument that uh, attempts to interpret the constitution in a decentralized uh, manner or uh, difficult because the text itself yeah. uh, envisions a certain vision like because there's always silences and there's always an interpretive choice yeah. to be made yeah that's a great question so it's a bit of all things right so the the first thing is that the text is is a problem you know um i'll give you an example which i didn't have time to mention article 357 of the of the constitution right which deals with emergencies and dismissal of state governments and so on until the 42nd amendment there was a provision that said that um, if you make any alterations to you know uh, the state while it's under president's rule then unless ratified by the state legislature when it comes back uh, you know into power after the emergency is over uh, those changes will lapse right so the idea was that during president's rule the center is only meant to engage in administrative you know issues just just tiding over until the emergency is over and the default has to be the state assembly and so they have to ratify any changes you make when they come back eventually for the second amendment removes that provision altogether and so now the default is that actually any changes that are made during president's rule persist uh, even after president's rule is over and now imagine a situation where the changes are such that the state as such cannot undo them right so for instance uh, article 370 right so when you degrade jammu and kashmir into a union territory during president's rule and when say you then have elections and now you have a ut of jnk you know government or assembly back in power they can't upgrade themselves back into a state because you've taken the power away from them right so you have made a permanent alteration into the constitution 
using a temporary presence rule arrangement and up to a point that would lapse the default was that that would lapse you couldn't actually make it permanent now the now the default is that it will continue right so that's where the text comes in so the text through its silences ambiguities and provisions directs you towards one outcome which in the indian constitution's case is often an outcome towards centralization right so that's the issue with the text now at the same time the text is never never determinative right so it's always open to interpretation and one argument and this is the argument that we have made in the 370 case is that yes there is no explicit uh, clause now in 357 that makes it temporary but the federal principle requires you to place an implied limitation on the powers of the central government during president's rule right so you you can't actually if if there are fundamental principles in the constitution involving the federal structure democracy and so on that they place implied limitations upon powers that are meant to be temporary and there the court has a choice right the court can choose to accept that and the court has in past chosen to accept arguments of that kind or the court can reject that right so so it's it also comes down then to how those silences are interpreted right so it's so it's both things uh the text it creates a drift and interpretation can either mitigate the drift or accelerate it uh, and uh, my argument is that historically for the for a, for 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 the most part uh there has been the drift in the text which the courts have chosen to accelerate and not mitigate hello hi i'm ari uh, and i'm a law student so my question is like i concede i agree with you that the executive in the constitutional scheme seems all powerful right uh, be it federal structure or otherwise and then so then it takes me back to a quote that ambedkar said right and ambedkar said one something along the lines of that the constitution how the constitution is actually enacted would actually depend on the government of the day so then that leads me to believe then shouldn't the struggle for power or like say if i don't agree with the bjp should be taken away from court and so like say someone like apar gupta said he went away from litigation because he believed in policy I, I, i'm not sure if that's enough like my professor arun ended our constitutional course with saying something like like he's completely lost hope within the constitution whoever the executive is they can make it say whatever they wanted to so then my argument is simple in the sense that even if we have an activist court even if we have great liberal judgments do you think that's enough and it seems to me india is not a product of its constitution but the current government so in that you know context in that light what role do you see yourself as i know you litigate within the supreme court or what advice would you give to law students who want to litigate in the future yeah i think there's a lot lot to unpack there so first thing is that look um you i mean you may lose hope in you know the the court and all of that but the court's not going to go away right like it's it's there uh, and cases will be brought to it right so your losing hope or not losing hope ultimately is not going to change the fact that sitting out is not an option because say when something like 370 happens it's going to come to court and the court will decide it right so that's going to happen and so then the question is then what do you do in that case and how can you sort of you know engage in a way that that at least brings the right arguments on record even though they might not reflect in the final judgment so that's one thing um on on what to do and the second thing is that uh, you know i think you're completely right in that historically it's never been uh, the case that uh, a court or litigation you know can be the only uh, you know sort of vehicle of of social change that never works a because courts are ultimately weak bodies even though they project power but they are ultimately weak bodies um and two that uh, if you look at any court in history it's always maybe 10 degrees to either side of of what the, or where the center is at any given point but never more than that because if it goes beyond there's a pushback um and the court isn't strong enough to withstand that so in that way courts always you know follow politics and sometimes they can carve in the given the right you know uh, cracks given the right sort of space they can carve out a role for themselves that is little independent but ultimately they will reflect you know the political situation and so therefore it's always i think uh, um it's always all fronts right so the courts are important 
but the courts are never the o- never the only the only front where um, you know you can advance a certain progressive vision of society it's all other fronts that count as well uh, and i mean if you look at say for instance the uh, history of say kenya which is a very interesting uh, case where uh, you know the where you had the one party state and uh, and the courts were completely captured by the executive and then you had a, a movement for multi party democracy a movement that really you know made the independence of courts part of its constitutional reform proposals and finally succeeded um, and then you have the courts emerging as a very important independent body that actually can check uh, the government so it's always i think like it's always multiple uh, avenues and without ignoring any one of them so in that way it's it's important not to ignore uh, courts as where significant constitutional action happens at all times uh, yeah Hi, I'm Atish, uh, and my question is that one of the axes that you mentioned was between uh, contestation between the executive and the legislative, right? Yeah. And you spoke about the anti-defection law. Yeah. Another aspect would be the inability of the Rajya Sabha, for example, yeah. to look at money bills, yeah. which has been yeah. misutilized. Yeah. Right? Now, would we can we argue, uh, for instance, that that provision already makes the case like the like the constitution uh, in the federal federalism case? there is an argument to be made that there is a centralizing drift can we also say that it is skewed in the favor of the executive due to that provision because it seems really strange that the rajya sabha cannot discuss for money bills but you can have a finance minister that can come out of the rajya sabha and secondly uh, uh, with the same like following on the same thing and i think this relates to the federalism also in the united states we have the senate where each state gets yeah. like equal representation <clears throat> india does not have that i think uh, but do you think that would actually uh, in a way also address the federalism question and also address the population question that was raised by a previous uh, uh, person so yeah what do you think yeah on the second i think the us senate is just insane like i think that that no one should be like adopting that i mean look at what they're doing right um, and if you just look at the the gridlock that is american politics uh, the senate is at the heart of its complete dysfunction so i don't think that is a solution um, as i said for me the solution to the population issue is more federalism and not having a body like the senate that will completely effectively act as an anti majoritarian um, body because you can't really have that ultimately you know you can't keep doing that on your first question yeah so i didn't have time to mention this but but um, the issue that uh, uh, so the issue isn't so much that rajya sabha can't scrutinize money bills because that's something you see you know across the board the idea is that money bills budget right is a lower house thing so that should be with the lower house the problem is that look why will this not happen say in the uk it won't happen in the uk because the speaker is an independent authority who will ensure that this misclassification doesn't happen right uh, the speaker is not carrying out the will of the executive but the speaker's job is to maintain the dignity of the house the speaker sees their loyalty as being to the house right and so that's why this won't happen in the uk in india the issue again is with the speaker where this ultimately why did all these why did aadhar ultimately not uh, go before rajya sabha for like veto because the speaker classified it as a money bill right um, so the problem goes back there now of course the court is trying to step in and say okay henceforth we will judicially review money bills to see you know if if they conform to the requirements and that's one solution but again you're risking again making the courts the arbiters of all problems whereas actually the issue is that you need to have constitutional provisions that strengthen the speaker and ensure that therefore power is given back to the parliament to legislature and not you know to uh, the executive anna errant relinks rights to the spatial entities that render them tangible and therefore the plight of the refu- refugee who's deprived of a special entity within which to anchor rights so taking that to a more granular level within the nation we tend to abstract rights within central sources like a constitution or a supreme court as a defender of rights but we negotiate rights on a daily basis at the scale of the city town and village so would it be useful for an argument to reverse the drift towards federalism to base that argument on how rights are specialized Yeah yeah no I think I think that that's that's a, that's an important point and and um, 
specifically i mean the de- daily negotiations and in concept of evictions and so on i think are important spaces where that can be articulated in ways that don't have to take recourse to sort of the center state sort of divide and and in courts so yeah no I, i agree with that we'll take a couple more questions thank you yeah hi uh, i'm deepak i am not a student of law nor am i a lawyer i'm an engineer so okay i don't speak as an expert so i saw one part which you didn't touch upon uh, which is about the judicial appointments right so this is of course a lot of controversy and it creates a little bit of asymmetry in terms of accountability so you said yeah legislator is accountable to the people the executive is accountable to the legislator but we have a free floating body here and particularly the way these appointments are happening was this ever envisaged in the constitution that a group of people say we know what's best and we will sort of decide who will succeed us i know that's de facto that's the status right now but how do we get out of that because we have seen what happened with the njac and i think you were opposing that njac if i remember correctly but at the same time this is far from optimum so, uh, a solution but how do we get out of this then and come to something which is optimum and f- uh the more fundamental question is this really something constitutional yeah that would take a book to answer i'll try and be brief uh, the answer is no it wasn't envisaged in the constitution the constitution envisaged uh presidential appointment of judges which which meant executive another example of the constitution being very very sort of executive centric it was the power was taken by judges uh, in response to indira gandhi's multiple abuses during her tenure and now of course the opacity of it has made it itself a huge issue uh, what the way to get out of it right now it doesn't seem to be a way to get out of it because everyone seems happy with the arrangement um, both the court and the executive seem perfectly happy with how it's going uh, you know and um, uh, because it's all in the dark there's no way of knowing you know what the motivations are but what models work one interesting model i think is say south african or, or kenyan model uh, where i think it's interesting so you have a judicial commission that has representation from you know all all spheres uh, the judges you know the, um, uh, the the opposition the parliament the advocate general and so on but you don't give the executive a say at that point so they don't have a say at that point the commission shortlists say four candidates for two positions it sends those four to the executive and the executive picks two right so you give the executive a say at the end but only from a list that it did not get to choose uh, so that's one method that seems to be working reasonably well because in both south africa uh, kenya i'm not sure the exact modalities but um, they, right now they have independent judges who have repeatedly you know gone against powerful governments and of course transparency so their interviews are live tweeted south african interviews are live broadcast and questions are asked and i i this is a brilliant question i thought that uh, they were interviewing candidates and they asked them if the what is the one supreme court judgment you think is wrong and would change and why and that reveals so much about you know a candidate sort of judicial philosophy so that, that the, there are there are ways that can make it work but it just seems to me that right now the present arrangement is is so entrenched that there is no incentive from those who can change it to actually change it uh, so i'm a bit pessimistic about it changing anytime soon hi um you were talking about how india is a more of a quasi federal government than a completely federal government and um unlike the united states where it's classified as many states coming together uh colonial colonial india was still viewed as one nation broken down into several provinces when historically we've always been uh, one subcontinent shared by many different yeah. kingdoms and many people but um recently with the growth of nationalist politics and the idea of um us being one nation needing one language and things like that um and you talked about how courts the judiciary uh, in spite of being an independent power uh being able to project power it's still a weak front to move towards pure federalism so it seems like the, the most efficient way to move towards pure federalism would be through coalition governments but considering how um coalitions like the congresses nda alliance i think that's what it's called uh they are not as rigorous uh as parties such as the one in par um about their movement towards pure federalism so how long or how much do you think we'd 
uh, need to be dependent on coalition governments since they're still uh, quite a weak front. I mean, I think that coalitions are essential parts of parliamentary politics, right? So I, I see them as being important bulwarks against centralization, uh, you know, in times to come. You know, that, of course, that depends on actually us electing a coalition, you know, uh, um, government and not a unitary government. But but they are, I think, es- essential elements of parliamentary democracies. So I don't see them as being a problem. They, they are one of the factors that sort of help check tendencies towards a unitary state. Um, but like I said, I mean, it's, it's always a multi-front issue, right? So coalition governments are one safeguard. Uh, constitutional provisions are another safeguard, which you have to obviously will ultimately come to court because that's where the you know uh, litigated movement, social movements are always there, right? So uh, something like the farmers' movements, uh, you know, a lot of the issues with the farm laws actually were federal issues, even though they weren't they weren't given the kind of airing that that other issues were given. So in that way, I think you have multiple levels of of possible checks at any given point, which are strong and which are weak is a function of what's happening. Uh, but I think, yeah, the answer is that they're all important and they all should be strengthened um, over time. Hi, uh, I had a question about local self-government and the uh, power access which exists at the state level. So it seems that uh, local governments aren't that effective because there's a centralizing uh, tilt towards yeah. in the state level. So to solve this, uh, is a centrally determined constitution uh, will that work better or more federalism for the sake of more effective functioning of the state com- or self government yeah i mean so it's the latter because if you look at the sixth schedule right you have this a similar attempt in the central way in that the governor has overriding powers in sixth schedule areas which means the central executive right so they've bypassed the state and given the central executive the powers to effectively dissolve sixth schedule uh, councils advisory councils to override veto and all that and that's been a big problem because that has effectively really compromised uh, the autonomy of six rural areas it's, a, it's it's complicated but broadly that's been the case so i don't think that bypassing the state and giving sort of you know power to the center to directly sort of uh, exercise oversight over local government is the answer i think the answer is that you know uh, like cities as genuinely empowered constitutional bodies is a great book by I think Ryan Herschel, the city in constitutional law, right? So something like that, sit, empowering cities, mayors, and so on. I think is is the is the better way than than sort of removing the state and like having a center sort of uh, local government relationship. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Bagai. <coughs> Bagai. I'm not a lawyer, but this is more of a question based upon, you said, we the people. So from a people's point of view, I have an elementary question. How do the centers send their police to a state and pick up someone from there? How does that impinge on center-state relations? Yeah, that's a a great question. And in fact, one point that I didn't have time to mention was the BSF, uh, recent recent extension of the, the jurisdiction of the border security force to 50 kilometers inside the border, which I think effectively means 30% of, of border states is now under BSF jurisdiction. Um, so that, in fact, has been through various central laws that cite central concerns like, uh, you know, cross-border crime, uh, p- protecting the national borders, going after criminals across state borders and so on, uh, CBI uh, and, and the NIA and so on. Uh, and uh, these have raised federal concerns, but they've but because of the court sort of overriding prominence given by the court to uh, centralizing drift, it's been very hard to challenge uh, that extension or that function creep, where you cite cross-border issues to justify uh, sending police into states. So that's the justification that the the, the issue requ- requires. Uh, central intervention because it's not just one state but embodies many states and in fact as I said when when Tada was challenged uh, the argument was that um, policing is a state is a state uh, function under under list two so how is the center sort of just deciding how uh, states will will police uh, you know crimes and then the answer was that terrorism is a global problem and therefore has has to have a central response so that's been the justification like throughout for all these laws. We'll close the Q&A here. 
And I think I'll take the opportunity to thank Gautam from this point. Uh, Gautam, thank you. That was a, such a such a thought provoking and insightful lecture. And at you know somewhere in the middle, you said that the words "we the people" had the, the people had disappeared after the ringing uh, introduction, as you put it. And I hope uh, explorations by the likes of you and other legal scholars will get more of us people thinking about our relationship to the states, to the power, to our roles as citizens uh, in this. And I don't think it's only about this particular juncture because we're all very worried about our country at this point in time, but perhaps it really behooves us all to take our civics lessons in school more, more seriously than I did for sure. Thank you so much. For, and thank you all for being here today with us and for all your wonderful questions.